Hi, I'm John Mann. I've been a pilot in a lot of aircraft, and today we're going to go behind the wings of a long-range supersonic jet fighter and fighter bomber McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom II. I flew the Air Force's F-4, and today we're going to also talk to another aviator, a former Air Force pilot who flew the F-4 both operationally and in operational tests and evaluation. When the MiGs came up, they were expecting 105s and they saw F-4s. That day, seven MiGs were shot down. This one's going to be cool. It's time to go behind the wings. We're here at the Wings or the Rockies Air and Space Museum, where there are more than 70 aircraft and spacecraft in this iconic World War II hangar. One of them is the F-4 Phantom. Let's go take a look. In the mid-1950s, McDonnell Aircraft proposed a larger, more versatile twin-engine version of the F-3H Demon they were making for the Navy. The first F-4 was delivered to the U.S. Navy in 1960 and to the Air Force in 1963. By the time it went out of production in 1979, more than 5,000 Phantoms had been built and it had become one of the most successful fighter aircraft since World War II. The F-4 was designed to do two roles for the Navy, all-weather fleet defense and ground attack. Eventually, the F-4 would be able to fly supersonic in an air-to-air -air configuration. In the air-to-ground configuration, it could carry more than 18,000 pounds of munitions and stores on nine separate external stations, including both ground attack and self-defense weapons. To put this in perspective, the F-4 could carry more than twice the payload of the B-17 of World War II fame. The huge advance in capabilities that the Navy demonstrated with the F-4 convinced the Air Force and the Marine Corps to also buy the F-4 in variants that maximized the capability those services needed. The F-4 gave the U.S. a quantum leap in aircraft performance. It set more than a dozen world records for performance, including absolute speed record, 1,606 miles per hour, and absolute altitude record, 98,557 feet. As you can see, the Phantom is a big aircraft for a fighter. Two GE J-79 engines can push it to Mach 2.23. When the Phantom was being designed, radar, missiles, and electronics were just becoming important to the fighter philosophy. The Phantom started out as a single-seat airplane, but the fuselage was stretched to put a second seat for the Rio, or Wizzo. Initially, the Phantom was only armed with missiles for air-to-air -air combat, no guns. But as pilots gained experience in Vietnam, McDonnell added Vulcan rotary cannon. All these angles and jagged edges made the Phantom easy to recognize. Whether you love them or hate them, they all have reasons for being there. For example, during development, they discovered that the flat wing didn't give enough lateral stability. As you probably know, dihedral, giving the wings a slight upward angle, adds lateral stability. But rather than redesign the entire wing, the engineers gave a lot of dihedral to the outer wing panels. This particular Phantom was built in 1967. It was the fourth E model off the production line and went straight to the flight test center at Edwards Air Force Base. While other F-4s went to Vietnam, this one was used mainly for various forms of flight testing until 1982 when it came to Denver and became a munitions trainer at Lowry Air Force Base. Lowry closed in 1994 and the Air Force turned this airplane over to the Air Force Museum, who then loaned it to the Wings Over the Rockies Museum here. The F-4 went on to become an enduring symbol of the Vietnam War and played an essential role in winning the Cold War. To make this episode even better, we've got a pilot who flew the airplane operationally in Europe and in operational tests and evaluation in the desert. I'm excited to be here with my Air Force Academy classmate, Major General John Barry. John, how'd you get in the F-4? How'd you get into flying? When we graduated in 73, you know, of course, we went to pilot training, and then we got selected, both of us, to fly this amazing airplane, the F-4. I ended up going to McDill Air Force Base, like you did later on, and we had the hard wing, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the difference between that and the soft wing. And uh, then I got to, to go to Susterberg Air Base, you know, in Holland, a real rough assignment. That was an exciting place because we would be pulling Zulu alert. And what that meant was we were on five minute alert. So the horn went off, you had to be airborne five minutes, out of a dead sleep. You put your flight suit on, boots are in the cockpit, so you jump in, start the left engine, start strapping in, put your helmet on, start the other engine, get it going, taxi out. No need to call for clearance, because you got clearance to scramble and you're airborne in less than five minutes, supersonic in less than seven minutes, sometimes from a dead sleep. So how cool is that? Good. Well, that would be pretty cool. You know, after uh, Susterberg, you know, I went down to uh, Ramstein Air Force Base, and I was in a 512 squadron. But this time it was air to ground, not air to air uh, mission. And we were setting actually, this time, we were doing Victor Alert for nukes. Now here's something that, you know, most people don't know. You stand in front of the wing commander, when you're getting certified to carry nuclear weapons. So the wing commander asks you a question. Here's your target, you draw on the board, you're heading distances and times, and you ask questions. What if you lose your engine? Can you still deliver the weapon? And you know, if you do well, uh, then you're certified, and 
they give you an eye patch. Remember, remember why they gave us an eye patch? Because God forbid we ever went into a nuclear war with intercontinental ballistic missiles, missiles being launched with submarines. Guys like us carrying weapons like this on this airplane, if a nuclear weapon exploded in front of you, it didn't blow you out of the sky, then you'd be blinded, so you put an eye patch on. So if you were blinded, take the eye patch off. That's right, you got a good eye. JB, when I was in pilot training, I remember flying the T-38. It was clean, and they told us if there was one drop of hydraulic fluid, don't fly the airplane. <laughs> and then I got to the F-4, and they took me out to the flight line, and it was an ecological disaster under the airplane. There was hydraulic fluid, there was oil. Yeah. On top of the wing where there was stenciled no step, there were footprints. And there was a guy on the horizontal tail drilling holes to put a patch in it. I meant, I no longer have training wheels. So let's talk about how the F-4 flew. When you first get in this thing, it's a monster. I mean, look at the size of it, you know, and, and it's big and it's ugly and it makes a lot of noise and getting yeah. to fly an F-4, you know, is pretty cool. The first time, you know, you get in there, you've got an instructor in the back and you're learning the you know, intricacies of it after you go through ground school and stuff like that. But the F-4 was designed to fly Mach 2.2. Now, you can pull 7.33 Gs, you know, if you didn't have certain ordinance on, you can go real fast, real powerful. And when you put that afterburner in, you really got to kick it just felt like you were flying a real powerful machine. There's no doubt about it. Let's talk about Southeast Asia. I always like to tell a story about Southeast Asia with Robin Olds. In 1967, Robin Olds was the wing commander of the ATAC fighter wing Karat in Thailand. And that's when they did Operation Bolo. The F-105 was not a very maneuverable airplane. And the MiGs were having a pretty good field day with the F-105s. In fact, 50% of the 105s were shot down in Vietnam. But Robin Olds with his team decided that they were gonna fly the mission with the F-4 like the F-105 with their call sign and their altitudes and all the kind of, so when the MiGs came up, they were expecting 105s and they saw F-4s. That day, seven MiGs were shot down. And just four days after that, they did the same thing, but they had the F-4s mimicking the RF-4s, thinking that the RF-4s didn't have any weapons, you know. They came up and, and they aren't, weren't RF-4s, reconnaissance airplanes, and we shot down two more MiGs. Let's go walk around this airplane and then go jump in the cockpit. Okay, sounds good, let me get. JB, you talked earlier about the weapons and some F-4s had guns and some did not. So let's start at the nose here and why don't you talk to us about the weapons this thing. You know, I had the privilege of flying the C, the D, the E, the RF and the F-4G, that's in roughly nine years. But, you know, when the F-4 first came out, it didn't have a gun, you know, and they carried an SU-16, which is a 20 millimeter gun on the base underneath the wing. But here we have the F-4E where the gun is in the airplane. And what we got is a 20 millimeter round about that big, and we had over 600, but they fired 100 rounds per second. So we only had six seconds of, of firepower, which is not that much. So when you were firing it, you had to be very judicious about the use of it. And then uh, the aircraft itself could carry 18,000 pounds of weapons, but it also carried missiles and bombs. There are four AIM-7 that are under the base of the uh, aircraft, and the AIM-9 was, were carried on the wing. So four AIM-7 radar-guided missiles, four AIM-9 heat-seeking missiles, and we went through different variants over the years, you know. But the uh, airplane really is versatile. I mean, we could do air-to-air, air-to-ground, and nuclear weapons as before. JB, earlier you mentioned a hard wing and a soft wing, and I know that those were two tremendously different airplanes. So let's talk about the hard wing versus the soft wing. All right, so here we are at the F-4E. This is a leading edge flap. This is where we have a soft wing. Now, in the hard wing, we didn't have this, okay? And you and I remember when we flew the hard wing. So if you're pulling back on the stick and you're pulling Gs, and if you put in any aileron, we had what they call adverse yaw, and that airplane could go out of control, okay? It would go out of control. Out of control no doubt about it. So we pull in a stick, and then we'd roll the airplane with rudder. And if you went anywhere left or right on the airline, you know, you get this adverse yaw, and you put the airplane out of control. This solved that problem. So when we were pulling back in a stick, and you put an aileron, you didn't put the airplane out of control. So this was a big, big change between the hard wing and the soft wing. And it's an important change, because in yeah. pilot training, you learn to use the stick left and right with the ailerons to roll. Yeah. So you go from there where you've learned how to fly one way to this airplane where if you fly that way, it's not going to end well. When this first airplane was designed, they kept experimenting. They had it flat, you know, on the wing and then they raised it up a little bit. And they had the tail actually up one time. Didn't have computers in those days, so we yeah. had to do that kind of a testing. But it's an amazing airplane, incredibly maneuverable, lots of versatility and in what it can do. 
and uh, it was a lot of fun to fly, there's no doubt about it. So that helps us understand maneuvering, but we also know that maneuvering costs energy, costs airspeed. So to push this thing while you're maneuvering, two big howling J79 engines. Let's go back to the back of the airplane. Well, JB, here we are at the back of the airplane, the business end for the engines, the howling J79 engine that pushed this thing through the sky. Yeah, amazing engine. J79, 11,000 pounds of thrust. When they put the afterburner in, it was a real kick in the pants, you know, as we both know. And, you know, when you think about fuel, to be able to uh, feed this monster, you know, if you had all of the fuel on the internal and all the fuel in the external tanks, you're talking about 3,000 gallons. 3,000 gallons could be burned up on one flight, you know, maybe an hour and a half, two hours, depending on what you were doing. And that's enough fuel. You could run your car for 10 years. So it did eat a lot of energy to be able to do this thing, and the J79 was a powerful, powerful engine. John, you talked about scrambling out of Schusterberg. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about how you got the thing started so quickly for your scrambles? Well, you know, there's two ways to start the engine. One was with an APU auxiliary power unit big monster of a piece of equipment, big hose, hook it up to the engine, you know, start one, disconnect it, move it over to the other one, the auxiliary power unit, get the engine going. But then for the scrambles, we didn't have time to do that. So we have these explosive cartridges that would be in there. It would be big smoke in the back and would be enough to turn the engine where you could get some, you know, rotation on the engine, move the throttle forward, get the fuel in and start the engine on a scramble. Two different ways, but it's not like civilian airplanes where you just kind of flip a switch and the engine starts. You either did it with the auxiliary power unit with air, or you did it with the explosive charge. Compelling way to go. My first scramble, I did the bang start. I was late getting the throttle up, wouldn't start. Wouldn't start. And now I'm done, <laughs> because the cartridge is gone. One more thing at the back end of the airplane, JB talked about how to make it go. Let's talk about how to make it stop. In over 2,000 hours of flying the F-4, I think I've used this hook maybe a dozen times. And it was usually for emergencies. So when would we use it in the Air Force? Well, I had hydraulic failure a couple of times where you don't have your brakes, you had to take it. Or when it was really icy on, on different runways because we're in Europe at different times during the Cold War. And the other thing I just want to mention is a chute. We landed every single time and pulled a chute. Now, if you land on an aircraft carrier, obviously you stop right away. You don't need a chute, but for us, Every single flight, you pull the chute. Every time you, you taxied off the runway, you release the chute. Crew chief came back, picked it up. They'd pack it up again, stick it in the back here. Every single flight. Well, John, this is a really good look at the outside of the airplane, but we both know that the pilot's office is in the cockpit. Let's go take a look inside the cockpit. Well, here we are in the cockpit. John's sitting here, and I don't remember it being this small, but it sure is small and cramped, and there's a lot of round dials. Talk to us about what you liked and didn't like. We got our normal stick, you know, got the throttle. But the interesting thing, it's two engines. So when you move the throttle forward, you had to go past a detent to get to afterburner. Remember that? Yeah. But the interesting thing was, you know, when you get a young person that brings up in the cockpit, oh man, there's a lot of switches here. Well, most of the switches we set before we took off. And so it wasn't you're switching all of these things all the time. And you compartmentalized where you looked for what you needed. If you're in a dogfight, your head's out all the time and you're being able to shoot. So on the stick, you know, we have a button that would shoot the missiles. You have the trigger that would shoot the gun. When you went to air to ground and you had weapons as bombs, we'd hit the pickle button and release the weapons that way. But we got things like a gun camera, so you could record your flight, particularly if you were registering any kills air to air or even air to ground as you're dropping your weapons. Basically, your head was on a swivel. You had your ejection seat. You could either use the handles or with the handle in between your legs. But you always had to straighten your back before you ejected. Thank God I never had to do that. I'd pull it straight up and out you went. Now, if you did eject, the ejection sequence was the back seater went first and then you went second. Because if you went first, you'd probably burn them because of the rockets underneath the seat to get you clear. But the canopy would go, the seat would go then the chute would open automatically. Remember we had straps around our legs yeah. then that would be connected to the bottom because if you ever injected, it, it would pull your legs in and then you go out because you wouldn't want to have your legs dangling out because it probably, you yeah, get, you get the, injured. People may have a hard time understanding that at 400 knots, the air is like a brick wall. Oh, yeah. So that was, to, the leg garters were to prevent your legs from flailing and you could actually break a leg or, or worse yeah. if they were not restrained like that. John, that's a great overview of the cockpit, a great overview of the airplane. Let's jump out of this thing and talk about how the F-4 flew its last sortie. 
if I'm not mistaken, you were up when the last F-4 flew in combat. I was a wing commander in Inchlik. So we had F-4Gs there from Idaho and the Guard. They flew in northern Iraq, you know, every single day when we were doing Provide Comfort and Northern Watch. So it came to the last flight of an F-4 in a combat zone. It was F-4G, okay? And we knew it was the last flight of an F-4 ever to be in a combat zone. I flew F-16s on their, you know, wing supporting the effort. Nothing happened that day. We didn't have a, it was pretty mundane uh, flight over northern Iraq. But I do remember when we all landed, the champagne came out. That was the last flight of the F-4 in a combat zone. And we had an amazing party that night. <laughs> of course, uh, the F-4 stopped flying. Uh, really, in 2016, it started being used, which is hard to say, as a target drone that we would actually shoot missiles at. And it's still flying today yeah. as part of that. Hats off to the F-4 and all of its different variants. You know, the Phantom did its job. I know we were both proud to fly it. You know, John, when you go to a museum with an airplane, you talk about how it flew and how it did this and that. People we always tend to shortchange are the maintenance guys. This airplane required a lot of man hours to fly. Well, especially when we did surges. Remember, we would just yeah. turn airplanes over, maybe fly the same airplane three, four, maybe five times, and even in one day. You know, they really were, you know, heroes when we talk about particularly in combat zones and what they were able to do everything. So hats off to our maintainers. Yeah. It's really great to see you again, see the airplane, look at it. Some serious memories, great times. Okay. Thanks classmate. We couldn't cover everything, so leave your comments and questions under the video. We'll get to as many as we can. And come out to the museum, see this F4. Now, you've made it to the end of the video. If you subscribe, thank you. And if you don't subscribe, we'll just do it. I'm gonna go see some other airplanes.